Welcome back to Department 1, People versus Robert Durst. Our jurors and alternates all have returned. Mr. Durst is present with his lawyers, Mr. DeGarren and Mr. Chesnoff. We have Mr. Lewin and Mr. Milius, Mr. Balian, Mr. Miata this morning. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, We've been able to resolve the Wednesday afternoon conflict on our end. So we can be in session on both the morning and the afternoon of Wednesday, uh, of Wednesday, which is very helpful for us finishing on time. Has anyone made any plans that cannot easily be, be changed for that uh, Wednesday afternoon? Then good. Let's take advantage of that time and and uh, and be in session all day on, on Wednesday. So with that, very good. Thank you. And uh, shall we resume the examination, Mr. DeGarren? Yes, Your Honor. We have a, a stipulation as the foundation for some documents. Excellent. I have marked as Defendant's Exhibit N. Uh, they're from the Building Inspection uh, Division of the San Francisco. Uh, it's more than a foundation stipulation. I told Mr. Garen we're more than happy to stipulate that those can be uh, admitted into evidence. So Great. And this is, uh, are we on? N. N. All right. Defense Exhibit N. Do you wish to read those to the jury? Yes, sir. Or, right. or do you wish to uh, read the stipulation uh, to the authenticity of this document? Yes, Your Honor. It's uh, it basically it's a application for a building permit for the Telegraph Hill property, 52 through 54 Telegraph Place. Shown shows that Mike Yoshida applied for the building permit on March the third. 2000. There's another date, March the 3rd, 2000, and several documents. Uh, that coincide with this document all concerning the uh, alterations and additions to the townhouse on uh, Telegraph Hill. All right, thank you, Mr. Gary. And thank you, Mr. Lewin. No objection. For, for the stipulation. We're trying to set the all-time record for stipulations. So. You've done it, I'm sure. <laughs> for a criminal case, absolutely. I don't know if that was numbered, but it's, it's up in the multi-digits. Yeah, grateful for that. Okay, good morning. Uh, um, when we left off uh, last week, you had just arrived in Los Angeles. Your plan was to eventually, uh, you and Susan, go to San Francisco to see the townhouse project and then to return. And I believe as we actually left off, you had uh, taken a wrong turn off of Interstate 5, but you then went to uh, Sunset and then to um, eventually got to Benedict Canyon. Is that right? Yes. Right. Let me move this closer. Is it on? It's not all. <laughs> As you got to Benedict Canyon, for those who don't know what Benedict Canyon Street is, would you describe it? It's 
one of the canyon drives, it ended the canyon drive, two-lane road goes over the mountains to the valley. It winds this way and that way. Most of the houses have very little land because the canyon walls start right away. So you'll have a street and you'll have a little itty bitty front yard. I'm sorry, say it again. You'll have a what? From Benedict Canyon Drive, you'll have a little itty bitty front yard, a small house, and a small backyard. Now that's for most of it. There are some parts of it that have large houses, excuse me, <clears throat> large houses and large yards, but that's unusual. As far as uh, the home at 1527 Benedict Canyon, where Susan was living at the time, describe that particular property. Very small plot, very small house. The front yard was probably just 12 or 15 feet wide, and the backyard was probably about the same. And uh, what about the driveway and garage? Well, there was a garage, the driveway, was really the front, the front yard. And as you got there, what did you f first see? Well, first, there were cars parked in front of the house, so I could not pull off Benedict Canyon, perpendicular to Benedict Canyon. I had to pull off Benedict Canyon parallel to Benedict Canyon. I could barely get the car off of Benedict Canyon. Did you recognize the cars that were parked in the driveway? No. Uh, and you were in your uh, Ford? Ford Explorer. It, describe the traffic on Benedict Canyon at that in that area. Lots of traffic. Okay. Always lots of traffic. So is there space to park on the street or not? No. Not right. legally. The tradesmen would frequently park on the street, but there was no legal parking. Tradesmen, you mean like plumbers and carpenters and yeah. so on? All right. So um, you pulled your car parallel into the driveway and got it off of Benedict Canyon. Is that right? Correct. Then what did you do? I got out of the car, walked south to where Susan's front door was. When I got to within 20, 30 feet of the front door, I could see that there was a piece of paper attached to the front door. All right, when you saw that piece of paper, um, what did you next do? I walked over to the front door on the piece of paper. What did the, yes, what did the piece of paper say? Was there a note on it? Yes. What did it say? It said, Bobby, I am doing my walk. Be back in an hour, Susie. And what did you think? I thought, well, if she could have left an hour ago, meaning she'd be back real soon, or maybe even she already got back. But also, she could have left five minutes ago, meaning I'd have to wait an hour. So what did you next do? Well, I rang, rang the bell and knocked a bunch of them. 
You rang the del bell? I or? rang the bell a few times, and I knocked a few times. From standing at the front door, I could see into the pretty much the whole house through the foyer window. All right, now we've seen some photographs of the, uh, some seen photographs. So where, when you're standing at the front door, after you were knocking and calling her name, ringing the doorbell, what could you see without opening the door? Well, straight ahead were the two bedrooms. To the right was the kitchen, and out the back of the kitchen was the back door, which was wide open. Could you see that from the front porch? Yes. Uh, could you see into the bedrooms from where you were? No, you could not see in the bedroom. Okay, so you looked in, you saw that the, through the kitchen that the back door was open? Yes. And what did you do? Well, Susan and I, three or four months earlier, had planned a similar trip. And Susan had canceled at the last minute. And she had decided that she didn't want me to have to wait if she was doing something. So she had overnighted me keys to the front door. So did you have a key to her front door? Two keys. What did you do? Well, after ringing the bell and knocking for five minutes, I unlocked the front door, walked in, and as soon as I got in, I could see the dogs. I don't remember if I saw all three of them or if it was just two of them, but right away I saw the dogs there. Where were the dogs? In the living space. And what did you do next? I decided I would see what was, why the back door was open. So I walked into the kitchen. When you walk into the kitchen, is that away from the bedroom? Yes. Okay, go ahead. What, you walked into the kitchen? Well, walking into the kitchen, I walked by the kitchen table, which Susan also used as a desk. The computer was on it. The telephone was on it. The telephone charger was on it. Now, is that in the kitchen or was that in her office? Say that again. Was that in the kitchen or was that in her office? It was in the kitchen, but she used the kitchen table as a desk. All right. And then what did you do? I got to the back door and I could not see the whole backyard. From the back door, I did see that the backyard was full of dog do and needed to be cleaned up. So, but I carefully walked back to the end of the, of the backyard. So did you walk out into the backyard through the kitchen door? Yes. And then what, what happened? Well, I walked as far as you could walk before the canyon wall stopped me from walking. When I turned around, I could see the whole backyard, and Susan was definitely not there, and I don't think any of the dogs were there either. So what, what had happened with the dogs that you had seen, dog or dogs that you'd seen in the house when you first went in? They must have stayed in the house. I did not see them in the backyard. Did they bark at you? Yes, they always bark at everything and everybody. Okay. Uh, did you know the dogs? Had you seen the dogs? I did not know them. I did not like them. Yeah. Did they, did they bother you? Did they? No, they would just bark. Okay. So now you're in the backyard. Uh, you see that Susan's not there, right? Correct. What's the next thing you did? Well, I started hearing a whole bunch of honking coming from the front of the house. And I, my first thought was, 
There must have been a, a, an accident or something. So I walked to the north of Susan's house where she has a gate and one of those little latches that, that you can un, un, unlock the gate. There was, let me stop you, was there a lock on the gate? You said unlock the gate. Yeah, but it's just a latch. It's not really a lock. It keeps the gate door shut, but anybody can open it. Okay, so this, this is on the north side of the house? Correct. Um, is there a passageway there that goes to the front? Yeah. What did you do? So I un un undid the gate, walked to the front of the house, and I pretty quickly decided there had not been an accident, but it did look like somebody had tried to make a U-turn on Benedict Canyon Drive because the cars are all pointed in different directions, like they were trying to get around something. Now to clarify, you said you walked around to the front. Did you go through the house or on the passageway that was at the north uh, side of the house? I don't know what the question is. I don't know what the question is. Did you walk through the house or did you walk on the pathway that's uh, at the door? I walked on the pathway. Okay. Now you're uh, in the front yard or actually the front driveway? Correct. And what did you see there? Well, I walked back toward the front door. When I got to about 20, 30 feet from the front door, I saw that the front door was open and the piece of paper that had been attached to it was gone. Had you closed the front door when you came in? I did not think so. Do you know for sure? No. All right. So as you get to the front door, it's is it fully open? Is it slightly open? Slightly open. And the note is gone? The note is gone. Did you take the note off? No. All right, what did you do next? I walked into the house, hollered Susan a few times, and figured she must, either she's still on her walk, or she's in one of the bedrooms. I walked down from the front door to the bedrooms. And as soon as I got in front of the first bedroom, I did a double take when I saw Susan. I saw Susan lying on the floor with her feet on her on her back with her feet towards the front of the house. Could you see uh, whether she was awake or alive or could you see? What could you see? She was just lying there. So what did you do? I shouted Susan a couple of times and I quickly ran to the bedroom where she was. Her eyes were closed. I reached all down. I squatted over her, reached down, grabbed her by her upper arms, and lifted her up. How, how high did you lift her? Six inches. What, what, was she cold to the touch? Was she warm to the touch? Could you tell? I put my hand over her face. I might have left that out to see if she was breathing, to see if I could feel breath and it felt cold. Then I grabbed her by her arms and lifted her up. Her head just hung down and I could see that her hair was in some kind of liquid. What did you, what, what, what was going through your mind? What did you think? What was going through my mind was 
when she had fallen backward, she had fainted or something, fallen down and hit her head. I also thought maybe somebody hit her in the back of the head. I did not imagine at that time that she had been shot. So what, what did you next observe? I wanted to go check the bathroom to the bedroom. I wanted to check the other bedroom. If somebody had done this to Susan, maybe he was still here. I wanted to call 911. And that is what I did. Let me stop you. Before you get there, did you see what the liquid was? that her head was in? I decided it was blood. When you lifted her by her arms and her head uh, fell back, what, this, was her body stiff or not? Not that I'm aware of. All right, you go to the bathroom, um, and then what do you do? I did not go in the bathroom. I decided the first thing I should do is call 911. All right, so what did you do? So I ran the few steps it takes to get to the kitchen table, and I tried the telephone, but it was dead. And when you say it was dead, what do you mean? There was no sound. What kind of telephone was it? It was a landline phone, but you had, there was no cord between what you held in your hand and the charging station. So <clears throat> when you tried to use the phone, it was dead, that is, the, the cordless phone was dead? It was a cordless phone. That's the right word for it. All right, so what did you do then? I put it in the charger and tried pushing some buttons on the phone. And it stayed dead. It stayed dead? It stayed dead. And then I took the wire, the electric cord, that went to, to the charger. I was just about to plug it in when I heard voices. You heard voices? Yes. Where did you hear the voices coming from? When I looked up, I could see through the foyer window that there were people, half a dozen people, walking past Susan's house south. When you say there were half a dozen people walking past Susan's house south, do you mean on Benedict Canyon or were they in the driveway or what? They were walking on Benedict Canyon. All right, what did you do? Well, my first thought was if somebody had done this to Susan and one of those people walks in the front door I'm having difficulty hearing you. I don't know if the jury is. They're having, diffi they're having difficulty hearing you. Well, let me take a minute and drink some water. Okay. Can you open the...
Okay, where <coughs> where where was I? You heard voices. There were you looked through the foyer and you saw out on Benedict Canyon some people walking south. What did you think? I thought I don't want those people to see me here. Why not? Because someone had done it. By then I started thinking someone must have done two sues and what it caused her to die. All right. And what? So what did you do? I waited 10, 15 seconds. So the people walked south, and I walked out the front door, shutting it behind me, got in my car, did a U-turn, went south on Benedict Canyon, figuring I would go to a, a pay phone and dial 911. Did you do that? I got to a pay phone around where sunset, just before getting to sunset. I picked up the phone, dialed 911, and a lady's voice asked for my name. I decided I did not want to give them my name. I was thinking of giving them a phony name, and then I was aware that my voice is very recognizable, that even without a name, it would be me who would be doing the reporting. So I decided that instead of calling 911, I would send the police a letter telling them that Susan was dead in her house. I'm not sure that the jury heard all of that, so I want you to make sure that you're speaking in the microphone. Well, I can't miss the microphone. Okay. No, it's the uh, silver one, the one of the mesh. I'm getting a message that the battery is low. Uh, okay. And Mr. DeGaren, you may lead him through that, uh, the answer he just gave, just to have him repeat it. Thank you. Let's go back and repeat that and make sure the jury can hear what you're saying. You got in your car, you took a U-turn, you drove to near sunset and found a payphone, is that right? Yeah. And you dialed 911 and a lady answered, is that right? Correct. And then what did, what happened from there? I decided I did not want to leave my name on 911 and I did not want to use a phony name because it would still be identified with me because of the way my voice sounds. All right, so what did you do then? I got the idea of sending a letter to the Beverly Hills police that Susan was dead in her house. All right, what did you do next? Well, I'm not real sure what I did next. Why are you not sure? 
why am I not sure? I'm not sure because I'm not sure. Somehow, I had pen and paper. Well, first, why I'm not sure is because I had had migraine headache the night before and had taken a Percocet. And that tends to make you feel groggy and hung over the next day. So were you groggy and hung over from the Percocet? Yes. Were you scared? <coughs> I don't think so. Did you did you keep uh, a pen and paper in your car? I, yes, I had pen and paper in the car, but I know I did not have envelopes, and I definitely did not have stamps. Oh, I must have bought an envelope and a stamp somewhere. Do you have a clear recollection of doing that or not? No recollection of it at all. In the uh, police photographs of Susan's desk, there is a box of plain white envelopes. Do you know if you got one of those envelopes? I don't remember doing so. So you don't remember getting one of those envelopes? No. Or a stamp? Do you remember getting a stamp? No. Do you know where you went to get the envelope and stamp? No. So what did you do then? Well, I must have got the envelope and stamp and wrote a note to the police and mailed it somewhere. What did you put on the envelope? Beverly Hills Police. And on the inside, on the note? Cadaver, 1527, Benedict Canyon Drive. You've seen that, uh, or copies of that letter in evidence here. Did you write that letter? Yes, I did. Did you lie about it later? Yes. Did you lie about it for years? I did not get your last letter. Did you lie about it for years? Yes. Why? Because it's a very difficult thing to believe. I mean, I have difficulty believing it myself that I would write the letter and have not killed Susan Berman. In fact, in, this is jumping out of sequence, but in in interviews <clears throat> with uh, uh, Jarecki and crew, did you deny it to him? Yes. In, even in face of being shown the envelope and the letter and a similar envelope in which you had sent a letter to Susan, even in face of that, did you deny it? Yes. Why? Because it's very difficult to believe, to accept that I wrote the letter and did not kill Susan Berman. Even to the time much later, um, not, not later than Jarecki, but to the time when, uh, before your trial in Galveston, did you deny to the police that were taking your uh, handwriting samples that you had written that note? Yes. All right, so back to the sequence of events. Do you know where you mailed the letter from? No. Where did you go? Do you have a recollection of where you went in your car? <clears throat> I decided that I wanted to get far away from Los Angeles. I decided to go to San Francisco. Bob, did you have a gun with you? No. Did you have a gun in California? No. Either in Northern California or in Southern California? No. 
Did you have a gun in New York? No. Um, you had traveled on the plane from uh, New York to San Francisco before you went to see Susan. Um, did you have a gun on the plane? <laughs> no. All right, so back to the sequence of events. You decided that you wanted to get a, as far away from as possible. What did you do? I headed north, figuring that I would get to I-5 somehow or other. All right. Um, in Los Angeles, do you know what route you took in order to get to I-5? I really don't. And um, for the record, I'm, I'm sure most people understand what I-5 is. Does it go all the way to San Francisco? Yes. And what did you do then? By the time I got to San Francisco, I decided I would go to New York. I had plans to spend New Year's. With, with my wife, Debbie Charizan. Well, let me stop you just a second. You're kind of jumping ahead of the sequence. You drove from Los Angeles to San Francisco? Correct. And did you have to stop for, for gas? Yes, I must have stopped twice. Uh, how long is that drive, um, in, in either distance or time? Eight, about eight hours. Okay. When you got to San Francisco, what did you do? Well, by the time I got there, I had decided I would go to New York, not to San Francisco. So the airport, South of San Francisco Airport, in South, the city of San Francisco. So I went to the airport. Now what did you do with the keys to Susan's? I have no idea. Did you have them with you when you got on the plane? I don't know. All right, at, at the airport, what did you do at the airport? I drove to a, a terminal I, I might have turned the car off. I might have left it running. But I took my bag that I had taken with me to Los Angeles. I got out of the SUV and left it at the, left it at the terminal and went to the first gate. Gate that I came to bought a ticket to New York. Now, Bob, uh, do you know exactly where you left the car? Was it in the parking lot? Was it at a, uh, no, beside the, car, the terminal? It was what? right up at the terminal. Do you know if you even turned the car off? I don't know. What was your state of mind? trying to decide if anyone would believe that I killed Susan Berman because I had no reason to kill Susan Berman. When you say you had no reason to kill Susan Berman, what do you mean? I mean just that. Susan was <coughs> Susan had been murdered. Someone must have had a, a reason, a motive, whatever, to kill Susan Berman. And I had no reason to kill Susan Berman. Did you have any motive to kill Susan Berman? No. Was Susan blackmailing you? No. Did Susan ever threaten to blackmail you? 
No. Had Susan told you that uh, the police might be talking to her or she might be talking to the police? Yes. When did she tell you that? But she was always telling me that somebody had telephoned her and wanted to interview her, whether it was a detective or an investigator or a reporter or something. Susan always had stuff, had stuff to say, and I had stopped taking it seriously years before that. So how long had she been talking to you about um, perhaps being interviewed? Years. The jury has seen, we've shown it to the jury. Uh, it came in uh, earlier in the trial. Check that you had written her in 1999, long before the new investigation had come out in October and then early November of 2000. That what was that check for? Back, as soon as back's not in evidence, it just the facts that are. <clears throat> Restate your question. There is a check in evidence um, dated 1999, $25,000. Was that before, long before, there was any reinvestigation initiated by Janine Pirro? That's going to call for speculation. Um, can't yes, can't right, 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 right. Um, sustained as phrased. All right. When, I know we're replowing old ground, but when was the new investigation that you learned about that Janine Pirro had instigated? When did that occur? I first, <coughs> I first heard of that from my sister on Halloween, October 31st, 2000. At first I thought this was some kind of a Halloween joke. But uh, the reason I asked that was to establish that, that the first that you knew of any new investigation was uh, Halloween, October 31st, 2000, correct? Correct. And yet there's a check that's in evidence uh, dated early 1999 for 25000 to Susan. What was the reason for that check? It might have been so she could get a new car. Here it is. It's on the screen now, and I'm not sure the defense exhibit number. It's exhibit M, Your Honor. Emma's in Mike. Yeah. Mr. Figueroa, do you want a stipulation that only says 3-3? Three, three. Do you want a stipulation that it's 3-3-99? Three, three, Yes, I think we've uh, stipulated yes. that. Okay. We all agree it's 3399. Okay. March 3rd, 99, 25,000 to Susan Berman. You say you think it was for a car? It might have been for a car. Her car had been falling apart. Okay. Thank you. So, the ultimate question is was Susan. Uh, trying to blackmail you for anything? Never. Did she have anything to blackmail you about? No. And the only time I remember us having a disagreement about what kind of money I would give her was when she, Paul Kaufman had convinced her to do a Broadway musical. That's that musical that was supposedly based on the the Dreyfus affair. That's it. And was the what was the amount of money that you had a disagreement about? Well, Paul Kaufman. Yeah, yeah. Let me see. If I... Must have. Yes, it's it's red. It's. May I have two new batteries? I think they're uh, double A's. Will you uh, bring that to the clerk, please? Bring it around.
Yeah. You may have it have one also, but the, no, you weren't coughing on me. But we only have one, so if we can have the next court next door have it. Maybe we take our break. We have to see if one works. That's it. I think it's most efficient for us to take our break now. So, ladies and gentlemen, do not converse among yourselves or with anyone else on any subject connected with this case. Do not form or express any opinion on the case. We'll return at 10 10. Obtain a new battery. I'll note that <clears throat> the defense has filed an application for an order shortening time to hear a motion in limine precluding the prosecution ar from arguing hypotheticals to Dr. Loftus were incorrect. And usually you need an order, order for shortening time on extrinsic matters, so pretrial motions or the, so, uh, the health motion. So you don't really need it. I'll, I'll, I'll sign it. So. Um, we can talk about this at the uh, uh, some other time. It, it's worthy of about five minutes, really, to ascertain what the facts are and what they're not. And so, I, this is not the right time. Well, we're taking our break now, but uh, we'll hear it at a right time. Yeah, okay? no, that's fine. We can even yeah. talk about it informally. Sure. You're right, and, and obviously, just so it's clear to the defense, those kind of issues are up to the jury to decide whether or not facts right but i mean as far as willfully stating well, we can be clear ahead of time if there's going to be a quarrel about what the facts are rather than me saying it's up to the jury i, I can i can rule out things that are, are clearly not the facts that's fine it, no no harm in previewing it that's I, I, all. I just kept hearing it your honor and i was dutiful and making sure that the questions yeah. Oh, my memory of, of your questions was that they were factually correct, but the problem was, was sort of uh, contextual or, or the words around those facts. I mean, you were quoting the test, testimony. That, it's fine. We'll talk later. Right. You, you yeah. Know, th th there's one other very uh, quick issue. I yeah. just want to make sure. Mr. DeGuerin has brought up repeatedly the fact that uh, Bob was not charged in New York. That's absolutely irrelevant. It's right, right, right. It's not uh, something they can argue. No, no, something. no. I think uh, that was, I, I think your misunderstanding is important. I think it had to do with, it, at that point in time, of what he was, it was more of a explaining his action, which ordinarily is not relevant in that moment, and for that limited purpose, it was. I don't think the defense is suggesting merely because it wasn't charged doesn't mean there's sufficient evidence. If they are trying to create that sort of a, um, well, insinuation. Well, I, I, I don't think that's what's they, happening. They did an opening. Well, your your Honor, right. he said an opening. He was going to prove that she got killed in the house. So how is it possible that we can't point out to the jury that he was never charged? There's my point. Oh, uh, yeah, I, right. I have a whole section on it. So yeah, you can't. Okay, it's not well, a, I'll, I'll, wait, I'll wait for the judge to talk to me about it, John. Yeah, we'll, we'll bring it up at the same time because it's... <laughs> Thanks, well, Your Honor. It's not really funny. No, I mean it's not. It's not. Uh, we've been through it, I think. But anyway, that's that's fine. We'll we'll hear this. Signed your. I signed your order. On the, uh, Thank you, Your Honor.